an electric train with an overhead pickup. It's an increasingly familiar sight on Britain's railways. But this driver is not at the controls. Though he's experienced on steam and diesel, he's getting further training for the electric line in this. It's a locomotive simulator, one of the first two in the world. And part of its magic is this projector which shows a film of the journey up the line and is so geared that as the driver puts on speed, the film does too. The simulator is run by this computer. It's set or programmed so that when the instructor gives the driver the signals and indicates situations like those he would normally meet, it causes the cab to react to whatever the driver does, just like a real train. The simulator was installed on the London Midland region at Wilsdon Junction in 1965. Within a year, 120 drivers have been given training on it. Today, a driver spends about 12 hours in the simulator as part of his full course. This is one of the most elaborate of all the teaching machines which are being increasingly used today in schools, universities and industry. There are dozens of different kinds. These are being exhibited in London and each is devised to give instruction following a definite program. You can't get more out of a box of tricks than is put into it. Here in the grounds of Loughborough Training College is another collection of teaching machines this time in a travelling classroom. This caravan goes round to schools all over Leicestershire. These are two of the early models. This is a simple calculating machine. Today, many work on a press button system. Teaching aids being tried out at Loughborough include coloured movies which lead on to practical experiments. The children watch this film about air, one of a series, as often as they like. Then they carry out a simple experiment in weighing air. Students at the college take part in experiments with teaching machines. Dr. Kind, the designer of what is called a group console, is with John Leadham on the right, researcher at the college and one of Britain's pioneers of programmed learning. This computerized machine not only teaches, it analyzes the pupils' responses as well and even records each student's progress. Each has a press button panel on which lights indicate to the students how they're doing, any errors, or even whether they're trying to cheat. Part of the college's experimental project goes on in some primary schools in the city and county of Leicester, among English and immigrant children. Here, children first listen to a story recorded on tape by their teacher. The boy's name is Tim and the girl's name is Pat. Next, special illustrated two-way sound cards tell the story again. My father had a fire of wood on the sand. Then, rather like in a language laboratory, the children repeat what they hear and record it. My father had a fire of wood on the sand. Later, they read the same story to each other. The grass, and we began to eat our tea just after we had begun a pretty little pony came up to us. Programmed learning sometimes comes in a specialised book form. At this engineering firm in Peterborough, apprentices are taught many of the basic rules of making and operating machinery in this way. There is also one teaching machine in the classroom giving the same lesson for any student who finds it easier to learn that way. After a class, apprentices can try out what they've just learned. In this way, 
Programmed teaching can be used throughout industry to train redundant craftsmen in new skills. Some firms make up their own programs because of the specialized technical knowledge needed for their work. But several makers of teaching machines prepare programs ready to be hired or bought with the machines. This firm at Ashford Middlesex employs about 40 university graduates to research and write courses of lessons. More than 200 different programs on many subjects have been prepared. Once a course has been written and tested, the frames are produced by skilled typists on specially adapted electric typewriters. The frames are then photographed one after the other onto a length of film to fit the teaching machines. When finished, they'll be used by children and adults to learn all kinds of things from school subjects to career training and even hobbies. This large county secondary school in Surrey is one of a number which are trying out teaching machines. They use them with large groups of children working through a whole lesson period, such as in this mathematics class, or sometimes for individual children working on their own either to catch up the others or forge ahead. Pupils load their own machines and use them at their own rate. Sometimes they also use calculating machines in conjunction with teaching machines. This machine uses sound as well as vision to teach and a dial replaces the push button operation. The programs in this machine are on what is called a branching system. If the student gives the wrong answer, she's sent back to study and try again. The armed forces have taken to teaching machines too. The Royal Navy, for instance, uses them to teach sailors about electricity. This is the simpler hand-operated machine on which the answers are written under the questions. To learn the skills needed to take off and land an airliner needs a much more complicated machine. A machine that can do this. The moving belt of modelled scenery is part of a simulator that cost about a quarter of a million pounds when it was installed at BEA's training school at London Airport in 1962. The cockpit, like the cab in the train simulator, is exactly like the real thing. The situations that the pilots in the simulator have to cope with are put up on the control board and their courses plotted on a chart. This multiple computer is needed to control one simulator and there are more than 50,000 connections inside it. Two endless belts of moving scenery are coupled to four simulators, each for a different type of aircraft. And the pictures are picked up by moving television cameras, which are controlled by what the pilot does in the cockpit. His takeoff or landing is projected onto a screen seen through his windscreen. The simulators are used mostly for retraining of pilots who are changing to a different type of aircraft or for the twice yearly refresher courses. Despite their cost, which today can be up to £400,000 each, they have more than paid for themselves, both in terms of safety and money. This is literally the way to the stars, for it's also on teaching machines that the astronauts of America and Russia are being trained for their journeys into space.